Oh, somebody give the Lord praise in the room this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, God. Amen. It is a great privilege to uh, be in church with all of you this morning. And uh, I uh, join with Pastor Jack in commending you for your dedication to the house of the Lord and being here today. I know uh, when it starts to snow, <laughs> um, it, it just kind of throws a monkey wrench into everything. And we've had uh, a little bit of a difficult situation in New Brunswick the last couple of weeks. In fact, even today, as far as we know, there are still some, some of our, our churches um, without power, pastors' homes without power, saints' homes without power in different places in our province. So uh, we're, we're just really grateful that you're here. And uh, this has been the case for the last couple of weeks. We've had a real bump, obviously, in, in online attendees from out of town because their church couldn't have church. And, and if you're joining us this morning, Again, we welcome you folks uh, on the webcast. Thank you for being with us. And we pray that the Lord ministers to you as well as in this room today. Um, I, I, I love Christmas and, and I, uh, I love church and I, I just, I love singing. Hasn't the, just the beautiful presence of the Lord during the worship here this morning. Hasn't that been awesome? And uh, I'm an amateur singer and songwriter. You didn't know that, did you? I write songs for Beverly all the time at home. I do. And usually, I have to admit, I steal the melody from somewhere else. Christmas is a wonderful time to steal melodies and just write songs. I would say off my greatest hits album this Christmas... Can you hear your cell phone ringing in your purse, Beverly? A phone, a phone ringing in the night. It could ring right there till daylight. That's off my greatest hits album. You're welcome. That's free. You didn't even have to give in the offering to get that. I promise that's just one of many great songs that I've written this Christmas. I, I just love Christmas. and uh, we're, we're kind of in a a little bit of a different place this year because um, I really felt the Lord impress uh, this particular series of messages on my heart. And I knew, you know, uh, Raymond, the organizer guy with the day timer and the calendar and, and uh, the guy that has heart palpitations if he's too far from his iPad. Um, I, 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 the Lord and I talked about this and I said, yeah, but the third part's going to end up after Christmas in this Christmas season. And... Um, the Lord basically, he doesn't talk to me audibly. Maybe he does you. Uh, he doesn't talk to me audibly. He gives me really strong impressions. And the strong impression I got from the Lord was, take a chill pill. It's fine. Um, and seeing as the Lord has a sense of humor, chill pill has been uh, actually quite literal the last two or three weeks. And uh, but, but in all seriousness, what we're going to talk about today, in my opinion, is uh, perfectly positioned. The only flaw in this message will be the communicator, but the, the message itself is perfectly per, uh, positioned for uh, the end of the year, the last Sunday of 2013. And so we're going to go back to the familiar text that we've been in for the last couple of Sundays. And, and by the way, if you're watching online or you're here and you missed a part and you'd like to catch up, uh, capitalcommunity.tv, you can go right to our current series and it's high def and you can pop it up on your computer screen and and you can watch it if you want to catch up uh, on, on one of these parts. Matthew chapter 2, uh, we always go here at the Christmas story, and the Bible uh, says uh, in Matthew chapter 2, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, everybody say, the king. You remember this? The king. Because there's two kings in this story. Behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews. Everybody say king of the Jews. So that's the other king in this story. The wise men say to King Herod, the king, we've seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now, this is a major problem and conundrum in the kingdom of Herod because he's got his kingdom very, very comfortable and he doesn't want to be disturbed by competition from another king. So the Bible says when Herod, the king, 
had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. We, we often say, well, there's three wise men. Uh, but we don't know that there's three wise men. In fact, it's likely there were more than three because the whole city of Jerusalem was troubled uh, when the wise men arrived. It may have been a huge caravan. And re regardless of all of that, the, the Bible says, when Herod had gathered the chief priests and the scribes together, very strong word here, he demanded of them uh, where the Christ should be born. So Christ is a title of the Messiah. He's demanding of them. Where's this other king going to be born? And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, the little Bethlehem, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah... Now, now here's the prophecy. Uh, everybody thinks Bethlehem is the little town. Everybody thinks Bethlehem is insignificant. But the prophecy said, Thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, you are not the least. You're not what everybody thinks about you. You're not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, another ruling title, and he will rule my people Israel. Now, again, that's not a problem for prophecy, and that's not a problem for the wise men. They have open hearts, but it's a real problem for the king. It's a real problem for Herod. And he calls privately together um, some of the scholars and, and the wise men, and he inquires of them diligently. And here it is again. He's demanding. He's diligent. He's pressing. He wants to know. He inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. One of the things about Christmas that it's very beautiful when we set it all out and it's a nice ornament or picture or decoration, but it's not true. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not correct. The wise men weren't there the night Jesus was born. It was an oh holy night and the three kings of Orionar and all of that business. They got there two years later. They followed the star for two solid years. They were so determined to bring these gifts to uh, the king that had been born. And so, so when Herod inquires of them diligently, he sends them to Bethlehem. He said, you know, hey, I'm in favor of this. So go and search diligently for the young child, not baby, Young child by now, it's two years later. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Now, that's not what Herod was after. Herod was after access to Jesus so that whoever this little baby was, whoever this young toddler was, he could stamp him out before there was any chance of a competing king coming into his territory. And we know how long the wise men traveled because when Herod found out, he killed every boy child under two because he knew the star had appeared two years previous. When they had heard the king, everybody say, the king, they departed and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And so uh, they, they, they come to a place. It's not the manger. It's, it's a different place. It's a house now. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, not the barn, not the stable, not the inn, not by the manger. When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child, not infant, not baby, child, with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Now, we know very little about these wise men. We don't know their names. We have names from tradition. We don't know what country they came from. That comes sometimes from traditions. We don't know if there were even three. That comes from tradition and from the number of gifts. But here's what we do know. And it's the most important thing to know. We know uh, what kind of gifts wise men think are proper to bring to a king. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then, being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod. See, you can't go back to King Herod and serve him if you want to serve this king of kings. There are two kings in your life, like there are two kings in the Bible story, and you can only serve one of them. You can't serve both of them. In fact, the Bible says they were warned of God in a dream not to return to Herod, so they departed to their own country another way. They never went back and kept that appointment with old King Herod. If you read on in the chapter, you'll find out later that Joseph took his young family even into Egypt 
and stayed there for a while and never came back to Judea until he heard that King Herod was dead. Because you can't have Herod on the throne and Jesus reigning at the very same time. One king has to die in your life for the other king to reign. Now again, we don't know a whole lot of detail about this story. We just know what kind of gifts wise men bring to a king. We don't know where they came from, but we know what they brought. We don't know what their names were, but we know what their heart was. And they knelt before the king of kings. Years before that, the queen of Sheba, she came to see the beauty and the splendor of Solomon's kingdom. And she brought very similar gifts to him in Second Chronicles 9. And Jesus said this in Matthew 12, 42, Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus stood ready to receive worship and adoration and gifts and honor. Not because he has a big ego, but because he's God who created the heavens and the earth. And so we bring our worship. If a greater than Solomon was there when Jesus stood in physical form, let me tell you something. Let me serve notice on this last Sunday of the year. Every time we gather together, there's a greater than Solomon here. There's a greater than any king, any ruler, every any business tycoon, any movie star. There's a greater than all of them in our midst, and he is still worthy of praise, and he's still worthy of honor. Don't ever get tired of lifting up your praise and your worship and your prayer and your honor and your adoration to Jesus. In fact, why don't we just break out of our little post-Christmas days? Why don't we just shake off the turkey and all of that business? And why don't we just lift up a great praise to him at this moment in the service? Because he's worthy no matter how Christmas was. He's worthy no matter how this year is ending for you. He's worthy of your praise no matter what fears or concerns you have about 2014. Jesus is worthy of your praise. A greater than Solomon is here. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. Now, the third gift, we've talked about gold and frankincense in the last couple of weeks, and myrrh is the third gift that the wise men present to the king of kings. Myrrh was a a very fragrant, aromatic gum. It was uh, produced from a thorny tree that, of course, grew in the Middle East and parts of Africa. And, and if you remember from last week, myrrh was obtained from the tree in the same way that frankincense was. They would uh, slit the bark and the sap would ooze out. And, and when it did that, it was a pale yellow color. But, but myrrh was unique. As the sap hardened, it changed to dark red or even uh, black sometimes. And, and it was of such worth in the ancient world. They traded it. Uh, it. It was worth a whole lot. Uh, it was so valuable in ancient times that myrrh at various times in history had the same weight value as gold. If you had a pound of gold and a pound of myrrh, they were worth the same thing in the ancient world at many times in history. It was extremely valuable. A myrrh was used in perfumes and it was used in incense and and uh, if you remember from last week we think that the Israelis they the the Jews they they learned how to use frankincense as an incense from their captivity in Egypt and so they turned what they learned in captivity into honor and praise and worship to God when they were set free well myrrh was very similar because if you think about it myrrh was used as an embalming compound if you put myrrh in the grave clothes of a body, it would preserve the body longer in those hot, uh, arid climates. And so myrrh had been used as an embalming compound for years in Egypt. Uh, that's how they preserved all the mummies that we found in the ruins of the pyramids and all of that business. And so the Jews took the, the very same principle and God spoke to them and said, I want you to use what you learned in the world. I want you to use it in honor to me. And, and so they did that. They used myrrh in the anointing oil. They used uh, myrrh in incense. And they used myrrh as an embalming compound. And myrrh also had some medicinal properties and, and you could ingest it 
if you mixed it up with, with wine. And so they would do that. They would mix myrrh and wine and take it kind of as a medicine. And, and just like frankincense was known for a very sweet smell, myrrh had a nice smell, but it was known more for one other thing. Myrrh was known for its very bitter taste. In fact, the name myrrh itself means great bitterness. And that's why myrrh over time became associated with death. Uh, not so much with fragrance, not so much with incense, but myrrh became associated with death over and over again. And, and many times in the Scripture when myrrh is referred to, uh, it, it does get mentioned as a fragrance uh, because it was an ingredient in all these anointing oils and, and, and incense. And it was used so frequently in the tabernacle and in the temple. But there are several places in Scripture where myrrh is used to signify its greater more important, more powerful meaning. It represents death and bitterness. Exodus chapter 15, uh, the, the Jews have just nicely left the promised land, they, or left Egypt for the promised land. They've just nicely uh, come out of the house of Pharaoh, come out of bondage, and come through the Red Sea, and the Egyptian armies have been drowned in the Red Sea, and they've had a party, and they've celebrated all that, and then they go a few more miles, and they come to this place, and this is the first event after they got free and they're already complaining. That sound familiar? People don't change very much. And when they came to Mara, everybody say Mara. That's the next stop on their itinerary. They couldn't drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Now in Hebrew, Mara is Mara, and bitter is Mar. So it literally says there, they couldn't drink of the waters of Mara because they were Mar. The waters were bitter, and so this was called the place of bitterness. Uh, therefore, because of this, because the waters were so putrid and bitter that you couldn't even drink them, that was why the place was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Now think with me. These are the people that God has just set free after 430 years of bondage. Ten plagues rained down from the sky and broke the shackles of Egypt off of them to such a point that when they left on that night of Passover, the Egyptians were saying, get out of here. Here, you can have my gold if you'll just leave. You can have my jewels if you'll just leave. You can have my money if you'll just leave. And they made in one night back pay for 430 years of slavery. This is the people that got to the edge of the Red Sea and Pharaoh has changed his mind and he's pursuing with his army and God opens up the water and they walk through on dry ground and the waters close behind them and Pharaoh and all of his armies, they're drowned. That's the people. And now they're saying, what shall we drink? Get a clue. If God could do that for you, then God can handle this little problem for you. Can I say to the apostolics that are sitting in this room, if God could set you free from sin, if God could break the shackles of drug addiction, if God could heal your home and your marriage and your finances, if God could heal your body, if God could do all these miracles for you, how is it that just a few miles into our journey we get all distraught and all depressed and all discouraged and we wonder what in the world we're going to drink. The same God that saw you through the big stuff, he's perfectly capable of seeing you through the small stuff. What do we drink? And Moses cried unto the Lord. And the Lord, this is so incredible to me, and the Lord showed him what? Uh, the Lord showed him a tree. And so Moses goes and he gets this tree that the Lord shows him and he casts it into the waters. And as soon as the tree hits the bitter waters, the waters were made sweet. And the Bible says that there God made them a statute and an ordinance and, and God proved them. God was actually testing them. Can, can I just tell you, I, I think most of you Bible readers and Bible lovers, you're, you're about three miles ahead of me right now. But in our bitter lives, in lives that were wasteful and wasted, in lives that were so down and out for some of us and so up 
and out for others. There came a tree, and the tree wasn't a bramble bush from the desert in Israel. The tree was Calvary. And when the tree got thrown into the waters of our lives that were so bitter, all of a sudden, everything changed. All the bets that the devil had hedged that you were going to amount to nothing for God, all the bets the devil had hedged that you were totally headed for a life of destruction and he was going to be your little puppet master as soon as the tree got cast into the waters of your life. All of a sudden, everything that was wrong was made right and everything that was bitter was made sweet and everything that was sinful was made righteous before God. And if there's anybody that even gets a clue about that, you should be celebrating any Sunday of the year that the old is gone and the new has come. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. There's an old song that says, you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. That's everybody's testimony in the house this morning. You don't know some of the junk that I was dealing with, but the Lord stepped in and the tree got cast in to the bitter waters of my life. And today it's all sweet. See, we, we get on this journey so far and we forget what the Lord did when he brought us out. We forget what the Lord did when he delivered us. We forget what the Lord did when he set us free. And because we forget, we start to murmur and we start to complain and we start to get discouraged and we forget that the Lord who brought you out with a mighty arm and a strong hand, he's perfectly capable of getting you through all the stuff that you'll face in the next year. He's more than able. <laughs> oh, I wish you'd praise him. See, you don't know like somebody in here knows what the Lord did for them. And so because they need to give God a praise right now, I just invite everybody to give God a praise right now. See, you don't know all the X. You don't know the ex-alcoholic. You don't know the ex-drug addict. You don't know the ex-perverted person. You don't know the ex-adulterer. You don't know the ex-sinner. You don't know like they know what the Lord has done for them. And because they really need to give God a praise, I wish everybody at CCC could just lift up your praise to God. You're in the company of the redeemed. Such were some of you, but you're washed. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You know what? We just need a little help right now. Would you lift up your voice? I, I know you're doing good, and I know, I, I know, I know, I know. But would you just lift up your voice and let a resounding chorus of praise just go up to our God? Because you might feel like you've been on the way a little while, and you got this down pat, but some of us, we're still stumbling around in this wilderness called earth, and we need Jesus. And we're glad for what he's done. Yes, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Somebody say, thank God for the tree. The tree isn't a bush that was cast into waters in the desert. The tree is Calvary. Thank God for the blood that washes whiter than snow. I know the devil keeps trying to drag up your dirty laundry from 10 years ago and dangle it in your face and say, look at the mess you made. You just need to look back at him and say in the words of Scripture, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth me from all sin. 
Mm. Oh, my goodness. Ruth chapter 1. The Bible tells us the story of Naomi. Naomi's name meant pleasant. She had a good life in Israel with her husband. But because a famine came in to Israel, they decided to leave the house of bread. Bethlehem, that's what it means. They decided to leave the house of bread for the land of Moab, thinking that if they could just get out from under all the commitment and all the pressure and all of the whatever of being God's people, they could just have an easier life over in Moab, so they did. You say, that's dumb. Yeah, but no more dumb than what we see people do every year. People forsake God and forsake the house of God and forsake commitment to God for little popper things in this, this earth. Stuff that won't matter, a hill of beans, 50 years from now, let alone 5 million years from now. They do it all the time. And that's what Naomi and her husband did. And they went to the land of Moab. And while they were in Moab, Moab, which looked so wonderful, Moab, which looked so awesome, just because there was a little difficult time in the house of God, because there was a little bit of a famine and all their needs weren't being met just quite the way they thought they should be by God, they left the house of God and they went to Moab and they traded a famine for three funerals because Naomi's husband died and then both of her sons died and she's left with very little. And the astounding thing to me as a pastor is that when stuff like that happens, it's amazing to me how people then turn around their stupidity and they blame God for it. Watch this, okay. Let's go to the Bible because it's safer than me talking like that. You'll think I'm talking about you maybe. Ruth chapter 1 verse 19. So we're way back in the Bible times. Okay, so you're safe. Okay, you're safe. We're way back before Jesus and Bethlehem and Christmas and Turkey. And Okay, here we go. So they too went, Naomi and Ruth, because Orpah wouldn't come back. They went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem, all the city was moved about them. Watch, watch. This is the question. And they said, is this Naomi? See, Naomi's name meant pleasant. Naomi went out full. Naomi went out blessed. Naomi went out with everything good in her life. She just couldn't see it. She thought it wasn't good, but it was good. She thought it wasn't pleasant, but it was pleasant. And so when she comes back, they say, is this Naomi? Is this the one whose name meant pleasant? And watch. She said unto them, don't call me Naomi. Don't call me pleasant. Call me, there's that word, Mara, myrrh. Mara, bitter. Call me bitter because the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Now, wait just a minute. How has the Almighty dealt bitterly with you? You're the one who chose to leave. You're the one who chose to walk away. You're the one who made all the dumb calls and all the stupid decisions, and you're the one that had different priorities for that season in your life, and now you finally come back and you've suffered the consequences of sin and bad decisions and horrible priorities like everybody does. It's like the law of gravity. You can't escape it. And you come back, and now, Naomi, you're going to blame God for this. And I'm amazed here in this story at the mercy of God because here she is blaming God. God did this to me. God took my husband. God took my sons. God gave us all this heartache. And God had nothing to do with it. It was the consequence of leaving the house of bread for the land of incest, which is what Moab means. And, and so watch the scripture. I'm amazed at the mercy of God. She says, she casts this in the face of God. I went out full, and the Lord's brought me home again empty. She's blaming God for that. God didn't do that to you, Naomi. Naomi did that to Naomi. Her husband did that to Naomi. Their bad choices did that to her. But we're going to blame God for it. Why then do you call me Naomi pleasant? Because the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. And here's where the mercy of God is so amazing to me. Here's Naomi. Not only is she depressed and bitter, but she's casting all of her problems back at God as though he caused them when it was her family's decision that caused this. Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Look at the mercy of God. So Naomi returned 
and Ruth, her daughter-in-law, Ruth the Moabitess, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. Just the fact that they ever got back to God's house is mercy. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. So watch, watch, watch. Her daughter-in-law Ruth comes back with her. And despite this little clause in the law of God in Deuteronomy, watch, an Ammonite or what? Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. That was in the law. Ruth shouldn't have been allowed to come back and enter into God's covenant country and God's covenant people. That was the law. But mercy steps in when the law says no, mercy says yes. When the law says lost cause and tough luck case, mercy steps in and mercy does something far beyond what you could ever imagine. Because we read this leading up to the Christmas story. So Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. So Ruth, who should have never even been allowed to enter into the congregation of the Lord, Ruth ends up in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And we remember that every single Christmas, that is the mercy of God. Look at the dysfunction in the lineage of Jesus. There's Rahab. She's a harlot. There's Ruth. She's a Moabitess. There's David. He's a murderer. There's Solomon. He He has all kinds of worldliness and all kinds of junk in his life. And there's Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. She committed adultery with King David. There's more dysfunction. That's just two verses out of an entire half a chapter. But when sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And if Jesus could have dysfunction in his family tree and end up our Savior, then don't you worry about where you came from because the mercy of God can step into any family, any home, any situation, any marriage, any relationship, and it can turn it around. And you're sitting in a great group today of cloud of witnesses that can say, Jesus did it for me. It might have been 50 years ago, but Jesus did it. It might have been my parents that came into the church, but Jesus did it. There was dysfunction, but now there's redemption. That's a family tree full of failures, but it didn't prevent the Savior of the world from being born. You may come into service on the last Sunday of the year, and you also may feel like an abject failure. But let me tell you something. There's no valley so deep that his mercy can't go deeper still. There's no chasm too wide that his love can't can't span it and reach you. Oh, I need more than the holy half dozen here. Would this church lift up a praise to God right now? If you've been redeemed from the hand of the enemy, for heaven's sake, show something. Say something that indicates that you're happy about it. Yes, 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 yes. So the heba heya tola eya sabaa. La da yo so sasha sabaa. So te re tola hoya sabaa. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. Look at the mercy of God. The Bible said in that passage that they arrived back in Bethlehem at the beginning, at the time of the barley harvest. It was the perfect time to come back. God was so merciful to Naomi and Ruth. It was the perfect time to arrive back because as the the, the reapers were out in the field, there was lots of food for everyone. No more famine, no more destruction, no more devastation. And so here we are on the last Sunday of 2013. It may have been the best year of your life. It may have been a year from hell. 
but it doesn't matter because you're at the perfect time. The first of the year means nothing to God except as far as prophecy is concerned. But but humanity, Pastor Jack already said it, we, we kind of cast our gaze at, at, at New Year's and, and it feels like a new start and it is a new start. Anytime you come to God, it's a new start. But let me tell you something, you're here at the perfect time. You're at the end of an old year that may be full of failure, mistakes, and dysfunction, but you can enter into a new year redeemed. You can enter into a new year forgiven. You can enter into a new year with your past gone. You can enter into a new year with a new confidence in God. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. It only matters what decision you're going to make. Now, of course, myrrh is one of the gifts that Jesus was given. But have you ever thought of this? Matthew chapter 2 in our text, the wise men come into that house with a young child, and they fell down and they worshiped Jesus. And they opened up their treasures and they give him gifts, and the very last gift is myrrh. Now, gold, yes. Frankincense, yes. It was incense offered before the Lord and given to kings. Myrrh, that would be like going to a baby shower and presenting them with a vial of embalming fluid. It's just an odd gift. It's a really strange gift. And, of course, prophecy reaches its hand into the gifts of the wise men because Jesus was born born to die. See, you're born, I don't want to depress you, you're born dying. (laughs) You're headed for your funeral. From your cradle, you're headed for your funeral. You're not going to stop it, prevent it, or extend it. It doesn't matter how many gym memberships you have, how healthy you eat. Eventually, we're getting to your funeral if the Lord tarries. You all look surprised. But it is going to happen. I'm going to last a little bit longer than Beverly because I've had more ice cream. But other than that, we're all headed there. The chocolate will catch up with her. We're headed there. But what a strange gift to give to a young couple with their young child. Here's some myrrh. And I don't know whether Mary and Joseph sold that and used it for money. I would hope so. I would think so. But I don't know what happened to those gifts. But I know that that's an odd gift. And yet when they presented that gift to Jesus, prophecy said, this child is headed for that tree. This child is headed for a destination called Golgotha, Calvary, the cross, the crucifixion. But did you ever notice that myrrh is the only one of the three gifts that's given to Jesus at the beginning of his life and at the end of his life? Because when he's hanging on that cross, and they brought him to Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place of execution, they gave him what was considered a medicine to dull pain. They took myrrh, and they did as their custom. They mixed it with wine and they put it on a sponge, and they thrust it up into Jesus' face, and they wanted to help him dull the pain. And they gave him wine to drink mingled with myrrh, which would have deadened the pain of the crucifixion, and Jesus wouldn't take it. You know why? Because he wanted to, and it sounds horrible, but he wanted to experience every second, every impact. He wanted to experience every feeling of sin and being forsaken and being punished for sin. Why? So you wouldn't have to. That's why. And so he wouldn't take anything that deadened his senses because he wanted to drink the whole cup of sin so that 2,000 years past Calvary, there would be a group of people, one of thousands of groups of people meeting in this 24-hour period around the world in different climates, some much warmer than ours. But Jesus knew that someday there would be people that would be lifting up their hands in thanks because their eternal 
destiny had been changed. Way more than a business seminar. Way more than a good education. Way more than a great job or a nice house. Jesus knew that if he went through the cross, he could change the eternal destinies of tens of thousands of people. And so that's why he went through it. And he wouldn't take the myrrh. And that means that you don't have to take the punishment he endured. You see it one more time in the gospel accounts and they take Jesus' body down from the cross. He's lifeless now. It looks like it's all over. It looks like we're done. And uh, a man that had followed Jesus named Nicodemus, he'd met with him at night, you remember? He, he came at night. He asked questions about how to be born again and Jesus told him. And uh, he was the one who came first at night. And after Jesus' death, he was so loyal to Jesus, he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a 100-pound weight. Why so much? Because this is where they embalmed bodies. It was like an embalming fluid. And they took the body of Jesus, and they wound it in linen clothes with the spices, with the myrrh, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. And they put Jesus in the tomb, and his body was saturated by the grave clothes, covered and filled with myrrh and spices and aloes because that was the custom of the Jews. And so Jesus meets up with this odd gift at the beginning of his life and at the end of his life and even after his death he took the bitterness of the cross and he took the bitterness of the grave so you wouldn't have to die for your own sins. People get all upset at Christians. It's not politically correct anymore to be a Christian not in our culture. And people get all upset because Christians believe odd, absolute things like this. We believe everybody born on this planet, we love them, but we believe they're a sinner by birth. That's not politically correct to say. We want to talk about human potential. and We want to talk about how good we are. And we want to talk about how much we can achieve if we just do uh, sappy human things. But that doesn't achieve anything for eternity. Every human being under the sound of my voice, whether here or online, we're born in sin, and we need a cure. It's not correct anymore to say that we're sinners. It's not correct anymore to talk about that. It's not correct anymore to talk about a hell that literally exists. There's an eternal place of punishment called hell. And people say, how could a loving God do that? How could a loving God put people in hell and in eternal torment forever? And the answer is, He doesn't. You do. You do. It's the same answer that we talked about with Naomi a little earlier. I blame God for that. Well, you can blame God all you want, but it's your choice that took you to Moab. And it's the mercy of God that will let you get out of that destiny. And you know what hell is? Hell is how much and how long you would have to suffer to pay for your own sins. That's what hell is. It's how much and how long you'd have to suffer to pay for your own sins because that's what you're choosing to do if you decide, I'm going to be my own boss, I'm going to do my own thing, I'm going to live my life full of good deeds, and when I get to judgment, I'll stand my good deeds up against God's standard of perfection. That's what you're choosing to do. People sometimes accuse apostolics of being people that depend on good works. We don't depend on good works. We may be the only people in the universe that aren't dependent on good works because good works, that's what everybody else does. I'm a good person. I'm a good neighbor. I, 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 I give this and I do that and, and, and I help the poor and I do this and they stack up all their good works but we're not dependent on our good works. We're dependent on the grace of God and the mercy that swept into us our lives and we live this way because we're eternally grateful that we don't have to go to a place like that we're eternally grateful that Jesus was born to die he took the myrrh that was meant for us he took the bitterness of eternity that was meant for us and he took it for himself and so we sit here today redeemed he was born to die for you and for me. Come on back to the music. And so we come to this very last Sunday of the year 2013. I know that it's, it's way too um, 
vary to make any kind of statement and have it stick to everybody. Because some of you may have had a great year. Some of you may have had a challenging year. Some of you may have had a year when you got closer to God, but some of you may have had a year when actually your passion for the things of God waned. And, and if you're really honest with yourself, you've slid back quite a bit in your relationship with God. His Word and prayer with Him and worship of Him and His people and His church, and it's just become less important. It, it, it could be good things, but they're not that good that you put eternity down here and you put temporary up here because that's what everything is. This time of year is a time when pastors reflect on the year past and, and look at the year ahead and we'll do some more of that on Tuesday night at watch night service. We'll do some more of that tonight as we gather. It's the end of the year. I, I, I always leave a year and, and enter another year amazed I'm amazed in two ways I'm amazed at some of the paltry things people give in exchange for their soul always amazed and over the course of a year years way too long everything doesn't remain static and stagnant over 12 months it's way too long and so you watch people people that you thought had it together people that you thought really put God first, people that you're just amazed that they ended up where they ended up because of bad decisions and horrible priorities. And then you're amazed. It amazes me how people that all the odds said they should never be sitting in an apostolic church on a Sunday morning all the odds said and every bet on the table said that they're forever going to be a sinner and they're forever going to be all about me and they're going to live their life and they're going to have their own selfish little priorities and they'll never be an apostolic Christian ever, ever. It couldn't happen in a million years and I'm always amazed. When you look back over what the Lord's done, devil, Nothing stays static. We have the ability that you seemingly don't have. You have to be the devil for all of eternity. But you know what? We don't have to be sinners for all eternity. We don't have to be defeated for another 12 months. We don't have to live the way you dictate that our culture tells us that we should live for another three weeks. We don't have to do that. We have the ability to change devil. Nothing stays static in my life. I have the ability on the last Sunday of the year to commit myself to prayer like I've never prayed before. I have the ability on the last Sunday of the year to make a decision that turns me in from a selfish person into a giving person. I have the ability on the last Sunday of the year to stop living unrighteously and start living holy. I have the ability at the end of the year to say, you know what, I've been putting it off. I've been checking it out. I've been wondering about it and reading about it. But today, it's the last Sunday of the year. I want to be baptized in Jesus' name. Today, on the last Sunday of the year, I want to make a commitment to God in my life. I have the ability, and you do too. Because devil, nothing stays static. We see the word, it's disguised. We see it one more time in Scripture, in the book of Revelation. And uh, God speaking to one of the seven churches. And under the angel of the church in Smyrna, that's the ancient Greek word for myrrh, it means bitter. To the church that's in the bitter place, write this. These things say, saith the first and the last. Listen, folks. I was dead, and I'm now alive 
So what problem do you have that you think I can't tackle? I was, you're not getting that. I was dead and I'm alive. I was in the grave and I came out. They crucified me, but I'm still here. Now what little problem is it that you think I can't handle? Because I can handle anything that life or the devil or your past or your culture throws at you. So write to the church in the bitter place and tell them this. I know your works, and I know your tribulation, and I know your poverty. I know that everything's not going so great. But look in the brackets. But in the middle of all that you feel that's taken away, all that you feel you don't have, Maybe Christmas was difficult for you because all you could think about was all these happy united families and your family was far from happy and far from united. But but, 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 but thou art rich. You've got something inside of you if you're a Christian that goes far beyond anything this world could ever give you. You are rich. I know the blasphemy of them that say they're Jews but are not. They're of the synagogue of Satan. God, God wants them to know in this church that's in a bitter place. I, I know there's posers. I know there's people that are just a facade. I know there's people that they want the name but they don't have the game. I know that there are those people. But don't fear any of the things that you will suffer. Don't, don't enter the new year afraid. Don't enter the new year with an anxiety hanging over your head. Don't, don't fear that. And then he just lets loose. You know, for some of you, maybe the worst is going to happen. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Every prophecy preacher will have a different interpretation of what that ten days means. So let me just give you the overarching interpretation. And they can all fight it out here. Your tribulation is going to be for a limited time. The devil can outlast the people of God. The devil, we can outpray him. We can outworship him. We can outgive him. He, we can outlast him. Your tribulation is for a limited time. So be faithful even unto death because after death I will give you a crown of life. He that hath an ear, if you got any spiritual sensitivity, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. The second death is that eternal separation from God. Yes, Christians die. Yes, we have funerals for Christians. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Christians go through all kinds of problems. Yes. Yes, Christians have sickness. Yes. Yes, Christians have perplexities and they don't understand why certain things come into their lives. Yes, yes, yes. But we've got something inside that transcends problems, transcends trials, transcends persecution, transcends opposition. And because Jesus took the worst for me, the Bible says it, what shall separate us from the love of God? There's nothing that can separate us from God's love. On the last Sunday of 2013, I don't know about you, I know I've got a whole list of stuff that I want to do different, better, and more committed for God in the next year. I don't want to let being a pastor slow me down on my personal commitment to God. I don't want to let being a full-time paid religious professional stop me from being a truly from the heart Christian. And I know that I'm joined by many in this room that you may have had a good year. You didn't backslide. You're still here. You're still faithful. But if you had your choice, you'd do it a little bit different. You'd die to that old way and you'd live a new way. That's repentance. It's the privilege of the people of God any Sunday of the year. It's not that God's more focused this Sunday. It's probably that we are. Would you bow your head and Close your eyes, and if, if you're comfortable at all, would you lift your hands right now and just reach out to God this morning? Lord God, I thank you for this great church, and I thank you for these wonderful people, and I thank you for the season we've just been through. 
And I thank you for your word that is forever, forever, forever settled and established in heaven. And Lord God, I thank you for the pull of your spirit that's here. I wasn't expecting it to be jovial because conviction isn't jovial. But God, I feel your spirit here in a very powerful way right now. Everybody doesn't get this. Our culture certainly doesn't. But God, we really want to give everything to you to put you first and foremost, top and preeminent in our lives. And Jesus, there are some folks here that they just need to leave the old year behind and they need to take a trip back to the house of bread. I worship you, Jesus. I thank you, God, for new starts and new pages. And thank you, God, that nothing has to remain static. One choice, one decision today can make all the difference for somebody. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. As reverently as you can, would you stand to your feet? Let's just not be a distraction to each other or ourselves or the powerful presence of God that's here. Just as reverently as you can. And when you get to your feet, just keep on going and lift those hands one more time. I don't know what you love about the last Sunday of the year. I know what Jesus would love. He'd love to meet you at an altar. He'd love to see you baptized in his name. He'd love to see you filled with his spirit. He'd love to see you turn around that, that besetting sin that, that you've battled with all year. You know what? It doesn't have to stay static. You can turn a page. You can walk away. You can step into a brand new life as you step into a brand new year. Church family, I'll tell you what we need. We just need you to lift up a prayer right now. What, what you're feeling is not something wrong with you. It's the devil wanting to steal away the seed of the word. The devil doesn't care if you shout, if you never get convicted. He doesn't care if you dance and run and jump, if you never feel the conviction that you need to repent. Because this is where he gets really scared. Oh, would you pray, church? I mean, like, apostolic, out loud, from the heart, lifted up prayer right now. There's somebody in this room, you can hardly wait to get to the altar because you've already talked to God about this. You've already determined that you're going to be different in the coming year than it's been in the past year. So you can hardly wait to get to the altar. It's not that you're backslid. It's that you're determined. It's not that you've walked away from God. It's that you're determined you're going to walk closer to God than you ever have before. So for you, the altar's open right now now. It's not open 10 minutes from now. For you, you need to step out from where you are right now. And no, I'm not talking about the same old, same old. There's somebody you haven't been in an altar for weeks and you blamed it on being shy. But you need to be in the altar this morning because you can feel it right now. God's got his hand on you right now. God's got his hand on you right now. When you get to the altar, please don't go into some silent mumbo jumbo. Lift up your voice and pray. It's important that we break through on the last Sunday of the year so we can enter into 2014 unfettered, unhindered. Come on, church. There's still more in this building that need to be in this altar. There's still more in this building. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes.
We're going to sing in a minute, but right now, we just need to pray. In Jesus' name, brand new page, brand new start, brand new story, brand new commitment, brand new dedication. Let the eres yo sabaa. Le da la bolo de esto saba. The Holy Ghost quickens me to say, somebody's standing here and you enter this coming year with an unanswered prayer. It's a serious prayer. It's a prayer that if it gets answered, it'll change your life and you know it. And you're standing here today and that prayer is unanswered. Would you lift up your hands and your voice right now and tell God, just because I haven't seen it yet doesn't mean I'm stopping, doesn't mean I'm giving up, doesn't mean I'm looking back, doesn't mean I'm turning around. So that ever a yo saba, let the edo se saba. So that ever let the esto saba. 